Good afternoon. I uh, want to offer a, just a few things I've been meditating on for the last few days. I continue to meditate on the psalm from last week's lectionary, which is Psalm 130. Now, the psalm stood out to me so deeply that uh, it was really the center of what I was meditating on last Sunday. Uh, the psalm is a lament for the uh, current uh, condition of our world. It is a psalm that gives us a voice to cry out and actually join the cry of the prophets and to join the cry of Jesus, uh, even as the Spirit intercedes for us. And we know our Savior is intercedes for the world. Uh, he says he, he does day and night. He continuously intercedes for us. So we can join in this prayer as a lament and but, we, but I've continued to meditate on it. In, in one sense, I should have already begun to sort of sit with the text for this coming Sunday, Palm Sunday. And yet, Psalm 130 continues to draw me, continues to stir my heart. Uh, we have a psalmist crying out from a, a dark place. Out of the depths I cried to you, O Lord. The psalmist is sinking in the depths of... Uh, Actually, that image of the depths is the sea. The psalmist is sinking into the depths of the sea. That image is also an image of Sheol, at the place of the dead. The psalmist is in an utter place of despair, which could be caused by uh, inward darkness, outer enemies, uh, any number of things. The psalmist is crying out for God. And in the midst of crying out for God's mercy, um, the psalmist begins to search inwardly. He says, if, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? But with you there's forgiveness that you may be feared. So this now becomes a psalm about uh, a psalm of examine, a psalm of searching the heart. Lord, search my heart. Cleanse me. Change me. Which is often what happens in times of struggle, times of difficulty, is that it can often become a place of personal uh, repentance personal uh, turning and returning to the face of God. Uh, but the particular verses that have been on my mind for the last several days is verses 5 and 6. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the more than the watchman for the morning. More than the watchman for the morning. So the psalmist is in a place of waiting. Now, that is certainly one thing we might identify with at this state in time in our culture and in our world is the uh, place of waiting, the sense that we are in a place of waiting, a standing pattern. We want to, uh, we want to hurry up and move on and return to normal lives. And yet we've been told that uh, uh, this, in this current crisis that we are to wait longer and and we don't exactly know and, and we want some people are trying to uh, uh, I guess imagine quicker and sooner uh, times that we can return to the normal life and, and maybe that will happen but it, it actually appears we may be called to wait for a season to wait but in our lives in a sense might feel for some people it might feel like life is on hold or it, it can cause some people depression and, and, and discouragement and I know some people are even uh, struggling uh, in other areas. Uh, e even there's tension sometimes in families in, in this uh, long waiting. And yet waiting is so uh, characteristic in Scripture. There's so many places of waiting. And, and I, I don't mean waiting in line, uh, waiting for a uh, uh, food to come or waiting for something that uh, is, is an inconvenience. There's actually long periods of waiting in uh, utter uh, places of struggle, utter darkness, um, places of fear. Uh, we know the story of Elijah, that uh, Elijah prays that it won't rain for three years. And so there is this drought in Israel. And he is. this is because he's praying for revival, that the king and the nation will turn away from uh, worshiping the Baal. But... Um, we find out later in the story of Elijah that there are at least 3,000 people within Israel that have not bowed the knee. So now imagine there's 3,000 people that are being forced into a place of waiting in the drought. 3,000 people who are suffering the judgment alongside those who 
deserve the judgment, who have abandoned God. But we have 3,000 righteous who have been faithful that are waiting. Waiting in a place of, of really danger. Some are in the, in the point of starving to death. We even see the stories, both in the story of Elijah and Elisha, of providing for those who are uh, poor and, and at the verge of starvation. And so waiting uh, in Scripture can be a very serious and fearful thing because waiting might have the sense that uh, I might not survive. And, and, and it's actually in those places when people might be tempted to turn to the bales of the land, to other idols, to other uh, uh, gods or other ways of seeking that uh, in addition to the Lord. And so Israel is often tempted to uh, idolatry and idol worship. And yet we are called to wait. And the psalmist is crying out to wait. Wait for the Lord. I will wait for the Lord more than the watchman waits for the morning. Uh, we even see the long waiting in the story of Job and his utter suffering. And most of us are not suffering in any way that could com be compared with Job or any of the other characters in Scripture um, that are in these places of, of really absolute darkness. Uh, in fact, even now, there are people who are waiting in places like that, some that are uh, sick because of this virus, but then there are others who are sick because of other things, people who are suffering under the uh, under cancer that are uh, waiting, waiting, hoping that they will be cured. Others that are sick under the uh, crushing weight of depression and despair. And they are waiting for the, the light of morning and, and, and hoping that this will pass. So there are all sorts of ways people even now in our world are waiting in hunger, waiting in fear, waiting in loneliness, waiting in darkness. And uh, in this place of waiting, at least in the psalm, is rooted in hope. He is watching for the morning. He says more than the watchmen wait for the morning. So there, it, it is actually a sense, the word waiting there has a sense of a, a piece of rope being stretched taut. Uh, and, and so it, what, what would that mean here? It has a sense of expectancy, but it's stretching me. I'm waiting for the Lord and I'm being stretched in that place, stretched uh, to trust him that he will be faithful. And as I was meditating on this this morning, and I'll, I'll be finished in just a moment. I, I was thinking of Richard Wormbrand, um, and I've, I've pulled out one of his books from my shelf, uh, If Prison Walls Could Talk. Richard Wormbrand wrote a series of books uh, of meditations that he actually originally uh, developed when he was in prison. He was in prison for the faith. He suffered both under the Nazis and under the communists. He did not have pen and paper, so he, he turned these meditations into little poems in his head and when he was released, he put these poems on paper and later transferred these meditations. Um, he expanded them into uh, developed meditations. And Wormbrand, uh, if anybody knows waiting, he knew waiting. And, and in one sense, Wormbrand is truly the first theologian that shaped me and, and shaped me in m many more ways than some people who spent their life in the academy. He, his academy was uh, the prison cell. And, and Wormbrand was a great intellectual. He he was Romanian. He spoke multiple languages. He, oper he could uh, operate within multiple cultures. Uh, he, he knew the stories. He was both Jewish and he had become Christian. And so he knew stories from multiple folk cultures around the world. Uh, and yet, as he walks through his meditations uh, of him being imprisoned and being tortured, you see this place of stretching, of God transforming him. He he says in one meditation, To what shall I compare my solitary cell? It's like a wood full of the fragrance of flowers. No tree in the forest gives off a sweeter perfume than the one out of which crosses are made. What a beautiful reflection. For him, the cell becomes a place of transformation, where he goes through the way of the cross, but is transformed into love. He, he tells another story. This is a miracle story where uh, an, another prisoner, he says, During an inter interrogation, a Christian was asked by a communist officer, Where is your God? Why doesn't he perform a miracle? Our brother answered, You have a great miracle before your eyes, but you are blind. You mock me. You beat me. I look at you with love. And that is the miracle. And that's one of the things Wernbrand says, is that in this place of stretching, he became a lover. He was transformed 
to love his enemies. And I'm going to read one last line and I'll stop here. Wormbrand says that he had great intellect and he offered great sermons before he was uh, imprisoned. But he, he, he confesses here, he says, I am sorry, I was never a good Christian teacher. I had not yet had my time in Arabia. Now I live in complete silence, absolutely alone. The guards have felt soled shoes. I don't hear their approach. They give me my food without saying a word. Inner voices have ceased. For long periods, not even God speaks to me. My conscience keeps quiet too. Perhaps God is reforming me to be a good teacher in the future. Pray for this. Amen. I pray that in our long waiting that we will continue to rest in the faithfulness of God and let him transform us into his lovers, that we might share his love with the world around us. God bless you.